Welcome to Aviation Consumers Panel Planner 101 Live. And today we're talking about primary engine and fuel displays. And these are popular retrofits that I sometimes see go off the rails because there's a tendency to try to save some money and use the existing fuel sensors that are buried deep in the fuel tanks of some of these old airplanes. One popular option is to replace those old senders with digital senders. And uh, one common retrofit includes the SIS senders, C-I-E-S. But that's not exactly an easy installation either. And in the hands of the wrong installer, it could really go wrong. But to get a better idea of what it takes to successfully complete one of these installations, I thought it'd be a good idea to zoom up with SIS founder Scott Philbin. He had some good tech tips for keeping the installation on the rails. Customer uh, gets this big screen engine display with, with all the nice fuel quantity indications and all the other engine stuff. But what they don't realize is that the display, like any engine monitor, is only half of the interface. Uh, just like your CHT and EGTs and all your other engine parameters, you're relying on, on sensors and probes up on the engine. And that's the same case here with these fuel quantity indications. But you and I have spoken before about the variation in fuel systems among similar models, you know, uh, and as the airplane is more complex, the fuel system uh, can be more complex. You know, you take a, an airplane off the top of my head, like a, uh, a, a big Cessna twin, a few fuel tanks. And so the, the issue is when a shop gets into these airplanes, you kind of think that not one of them is alike. And that could be a problem from an installation standpoint from a shop that doesn't know the, the airframe well. Is that an accurate statement? Oh, definitely. Um, and, you know, when you, you give the example of the Cessna Twins, you know, there were, oh, I think at least three to four different aux system capacities and configurations. Uh, the tip tank, on some of those models remain the same, but you know, you get into later models as Cessna tried to uh, simplify the uh, the fuel quantity, um, and you get you know a an entirely different system. So, uh, being very specific about um, which aircraft you have, you know, it, you start parsing down. So, I, you don't just have a Cessna, you know, twin whether it's a 340 or a 310 or a 414, it, it gets down to the actual fuel capacity. And lucky for us, most, most of the placards that pilots you know, normally reference is, is the indication of, of which model they have. But the, this introduces a lot of subtleties to what, you know, what goes on or what needs to go on in the aircraft. Um, Cessna Twins being very specific, it's a, uh, it's a difficult install. There's no getting around it. Getting to the sensor in the main tank, which is on the tip, um, uh, is even for me at six foot two, a long arm reach to reach the center baffle where the fuel sender is located. Uh, it it is not friendly, it's not easy, and then um, the wiring connection is uh, equal, an equal challenge. The, the aux systems are easier, but again, um, you have to remove uh, rivets to get a, um, we machine a adapter plate for the, uh, in, in the configurations that have the two aux tanks, um, getting a, an adapter plate that ensures that we get a nice good seal um, to that tank. Yeah, and so you know, sheet metal capability um, definitely among them, but really, um, you know, a shop that's really good about wiring and, and running wires. And you know, this the it's a it's a little different. Most avionics guys not too used, they're pretty used to running you know, wires between the, the firewall and and the cockpit. But you know, getting wires out to these locations in the aircraft, which probably and most likely had never been looked at since the aircraft was built. You know, is it is it is it just a, a step more of a challenge? Yeah, and that's the, I think some of the challenge we see with installations where the the shop uh it tries to use the existing senders and existing wiring. You know, you get into these major retrofits where you're tearing a panel open, you know, down deep into the airframe and put it all back together. And now maybe you've got one, uh, you know, fuel gauge not working. Well, you've disturbed that wiring. 
you know, you've said that not all old OEM fuel senders are inaccurate. Some of them can be quite accurate. But the problem is that the wiring and, and the age of these senders, the hardware, them, hardware themselves, can be problematic once they, once they get disturbed. So that could be even more reason to, to shotgun these old senders and start fresh with these digital uh, size senders. Yeah, and it's a point of support. Whether it's uh, you know when the some, some of the OEMs were using some of the best analog equipment that 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 they could get, the unfortunate part is those parts were you know either uh, automotive or heavy equipment, um, more likely heavy equipment attached, um, and they they're made out of um, steel, and so we're right away we have a dissimilar metal corrosion in. In fuel tanks, the reason we sump them is to get the water out, um, but water and fuel also create some interesting corrosion components. So, um, you know, by going to something like what we have in the, in the future, you're getting rid of a corrosion issue. But um, that that's one of the reasons that those units were failing in the field. And um, in the case of the Cessna Twins, you're dealing with a you know, God, now I have to express my age, but a 50-year-old now uh, capacitive system. And while the capacitive system can be made to work, the electronics are so old um, that it's difficult to support that system into the future. Um, with with our system, you know, it's current production and it's, you know, relatively easy. You can get parts for us. You can you can do that. You can upgrade. Um it just it's it becomes a much more viable solution if you're keeping the aircraft. The virtual backdrop behind me is a photo I shot uh, at Cirrus Aircraft in Duluth a couple of years ago, where these senders are stock on uh, lots of late model airplanes. Uh, these senders, uh, by nature of their digital interface, are compatible with a wide variety of displays. So you know maybe not everybody has a budget for a big screen engine and fuel display. Uh, or, or maybe they're happy with their existing JPI or Electronics International or, or Insight engine monitor, but they do want to add uh, more accurate fuel quantity indications. You can interface uh, these senders with a standalone digital fuel fuel gauge uh, made by uh, Aerospace Logic. Um, we we approach them. You know, one of the one of the component parts at Cirrus and. You know, the, the older aircraft, the fuel gauge was located on the center panel you know, right next to the fuel selector. And, you know, we reached out to them early on. We were looking for an alternate um, an alternate gauge that would allow us to interface digitally. Um, and they, they quickly came up with a digital specific um, gauge um, just for fuel quantity. Uh, and and he really um, Shane at Aerospace Logic really took this on, and he was one of the first people to, you know, I've got to have um, got to have imbalance warnings or other sort of sort of a inform little more information than the normal fuel gauge, but not too much that it becomes you know overwhelming. And uh, the uh, it's a great gauge and it's a great solution for, you know, someone who just simply wants better fuel indication. These, these senders are STC, uh, AML STC with a, with a pretty wide uh, pre model list. Uh, yeah, I think we have over 500 aircraft. I think the FAA pointed that out to us as we're going through. And then the units are also TSO'd, which um, allows, which is a, a good thing for us, a little more difficult of a challenge, but it really ensured that um, you would be surprised how accurate we are when we're, we're being shaken and frozen. Um, um, and that's the, the standard we have to meet. And it was, and while it's a high bar and maybe a, a larger bar than we need for GA, the fact that we've got it um, really shows that we're um, that that we've got you know everything in place for a long-lived aviation component. Um, we had a recent uh, OEM uh, highly accelerated life test, highly accelerated stress screening, um, and we broke their equipment. 
<laughs> there was some there was some uh there was some trepidation that the fact that the the association between you know what we do as a float based sensor and what went before that there was some correlation um yeah we proved that we proved that completely wrong bottom line you know what's this going to cost and it's a pretty difficult thing to nail i think because there are so many different applications and there's different levels of teardown associated with this and wiring and all that. But if you were to stab at it, um, you know, a very simple installation, you know, maybe one sender each tank, you know, pretty, pretty simple uh, up to a complicated airplane, you know, maybe a, a twin Cessna or maybe a beach Baron or something. What kind of hours do you think you might be looking at shop shop wise or shop labor hours to, to put Your these things in start to finish? Yeah, you're typically looking at, um, you know, I tell people four to five hours per sender. When you get to something as complex as a Cessna twin, you can basically double that. Um, you know, uh, that's that's a ballpark figure that works really well. You know, that puts, you know, 20 hours on the average Cirrus. They usually go for about 30. So, you know, six hours, maybe maybe six to seven might be a better, uh, better estimate, you know, that, and that works out fairly well. Um, you know, as, as all situations, there's people out there that are better and there are people out there who take longer time. Yeah. What, what does the uh, hardware kit cost typically? Um, you know, as senders are, um, uh, approximately $650 a piece. Um, and that's uniform throughout, you know, because we're basically, well, we're very fortunate in this section of the industry is that uh, the sender design did not change for 70 years, um, primarily, or the access for it. So, you know, we're basically building the same sender, and they're all about 650 Now, you, with a Cessna Twin, with adapter plates and other things to make things work, you know, it, it, add, it adds a you know, you know, maybe an additional hundred dollars per location, but not every location needs it. It's more than just installing the hardware and doing the wiring. You've got calibration at the end of the job. That's that's critical. And, you know, you had mentioned something to me in a previous discussion about, uh, you know, some shops sort of going down the wrong path by not double checking this stuff before they go ahead and fuel the airplane and try to do the calibration. So, you want to make sure the wiring and everything is sound before you start unloading uh, the, the fuel to do the cow. Is that, that correct? Yeah, that definitely. You know, we got a, uh, you know, I, I recommend to all the shops um, is when we do little seminars at uh, the Aircraft Electronics Association that you really need to wire the sender, ensure that the senders are operating and 99% of your issues go away. The unfortunate part is, it's real easy because, you know, essentially physically it's a plug and play. And so what what happens in some cases is that, you know, the guy installs it, doesn't make sure that everything's free to move. It'll, it gets electrically hooked up and then maybe or maybe doesn't work. And then all of a sudden the problems are sort of compounded and the frustration level goes up as well as the, the bill for the aircraft owner. So, yeah. You know, Getting that done, you know, electrically first ensures that, yeah, I got it. I, everything's good. I'm getting <clears throat> aircraft are surprisingly symmetrical with the relation to fuel. You know, the output I'm getting on one side is the same as the output I'm getting on the other. You know, all the connections seem to be made right. Um, then I can go forward with a, a fuel calibration and and noting in the calibration again that you know, I'm getting similar numbers for similar fuel quantities as you go um, from yeah. one side to another. And worth mentioning is that uh, Garmin in their installation manual, uh, they specifically call out for, for size senders, or at least they suggest using digital size senders with an, with an EIS upgrade. Um, um, Garmin has been very progressive about that. They've approached us prior to uh, releasing EIS and talk to us extensively about, you know, what we would see as, as the optimal way to go about this aftermarket. Um, and, you know, uh, they, uh, they continue to impress me about their thoroughness and, 
and their um, and their support. And we we regularly trade off information. You know, they have their own fleet of aircraft, and they're not shy about telling us, you know, um, what we need to do with our install manual or what we need to do with a, an installation. And it's a it's a good you know um, peer. It's a difficult peer to peer relationship because. They're a billion dollar company, but um, it's, it's a good relationship from our standpoint. You know, we, we respond very actively to their concerns and it, it keeps us on our toes as well as our OEM customers, you know, basically keep us on our toes. What's the website? Yeah, it's uh, uh, www, I think, which is redundant, uh, SiceCorp, C-I-E-S-C-O-R-P.com. Um, it should pop it up, but yeah, it's uh, straightforward. Sice Corp, and um, yeah, we look forward to addressing any concern or any any information that people you know. If you want more information, please give us a call. Thanks to Scott Philbin, and uh, you've been watching the Panel Planner 101 video series here at Aviation Consumer Magazine, and uh, you could look for a full report on uh, aftermarket fuel sender. Uh, retrofits, upcoming issue of Aviation Consumer Magazine. For Aviation Consumer, I'm Larry Anglosano. Thanks a lot for watching.